Hi, my name is Sasha Kaga. I will be one of your teachers at the Global Classroom on the Leuphana side. In this video, entitled Urban Cultures of Sustainability and the Tactics of Everyday Life, I'm inviting you to look into social and political issues in the city and more especially to explore the relationship between the city, culture and sustainability. First, the cultural dimension of sustainability. Since at least the mid-1990s, a number of voices have been stressing that the three pillars model of sustainability, that is the social, the economic and the environmental, should be complemented by a transversal consideration for the cultural dimension of sustainability. But why culture? Consider a culture as a complex system of signs and values which are influencing our beliefs as well as our actions, our ways to see reality, as well as our ways to live our daily lives, our memories and our knowledge, as well as those beings that inhabit our imagination. Here, culture is understood, together with the individual minds, as the ecosystem of human imagination, that is, a fundamental generative part of the fabric of human societies. As argued by Edgar Morin, Imagination is at the active and organizational heart of social and political reality. So then, what is meant by cultural dimension of sustainability? Look at the short article from 1998 by Louise Niström. You will see that she is stressing the cultural heritage of a city or town the cultural practices of people living in the city in their private and public lives, and cultural expression such as the arts, crafts and sports. She stresses how these are related to the quality of life in a the city. Then look at the article by Franco Bianchini, also from 1998. You will notice how he is advocating for a cultural approach to sustainable urban development, which involves an open-minded way of thinking, focusing on cultural processes in a non-instrumental way, and the development of equally open-minded public spaces for the meetings of cultures without foreseeable usages in mind. Bianchini stresses the importance of intercultural exchange and of participatory cultural activities by communities. Such concerns were also echoed in Australia by John Hawke's four-pillar model of sustainability in 2001, which discussed cultural vitality as a major dimension of sustainability, pointing at the inher inherent value of cultural diversity and of a vibrant cultural life of human communities. These ideas are then found back in the Agenda 21 for Culture, adopted in 2004 by United Cities and Local Governments, UCLG. For this, see the short text by Jordi Pasquale, the coordinator of the Agenda 21 for Culture. But then, what does cultural diversity have to do with a sustainable city? What kind of cultural diversity are we talking about? I invite you to explore this question by yourself this week by reading the article from 1998 by Richard Sennett entitled The Challenge of Urban Diversity. I ask you to think especially about these questions while you are reading this text. We are coming now to the notion of cultures of sustainability. The authors who stress this approach are looking into transformation in world views and our ways of knowing reality. Gregory Bateson, in his Steps to an Ecology of Mind, which was published in 1973, called forward a healthy ecology of human civilization as, I'm quoting, a single system of environment combined with high human civilization in which the flexibility of the civilization shall match that of the environment 
to create an ongoing complex system open-ended for slow change of even basic hard-programmed characteristics. More recently, Davide Brocchi, in an article from 2008, characterized cultures of sustainability as learning cultures, enhancing the evolutionary ability of social systems. After Edgar Morin, I have been stressing for my part that cultures of sustainability require not only systems thinking competencies, but also a literacy of complexity, a sensibility to living complexity. Living complexity cannot be reduced to a simple set of rules or simple beginnings. Thinking complexity requires thinking unity in diversity. It requires a capacity to think about any complex reality in terms of different levels of relationships. Any pair of terms is thought about with a combination of relationships of unity, complementarity, competition and antagonism. None of these relationships takes over. They remain in a dynamic balance and imbalance of productive and destructive tension. A culture of sustainability overcomes both the simplification of modern reductionist thinking and the simplification of holistic thinking. It allows to work with contradictions and ambivalences instead of trying to reduce or resolve them under one or another logical order. You will also find some clues by looking at the eight principles for an urban culture of sustainability coined by the Malaysian researcher Manikam Nadaraja. The sustainability of human communities today depends on their capacity to co-evolve with other living systems within rapidly changing environmental conditions. It requires contextually relevant capabilities to learn both in specific places and in a planetary context. Nadaraja's eight principles are focusing on how the symbolic universe of sustainable communities is closely related to a deep, spatialized knowing of ecological contexts and their local specificities, their diversities and their interrelations. Look further into this. I would like you to try the following exercise. Coming now to resilient urban communities and creative sustainable cities. One key issue concerning discourses and practices for urban sustainability is how we understand the concept of resilience. Not unlike participation, resilience is often used in mainstream policy document as a buzzword. However, some sustainability researchers root resilience in urban complexity. Hans Tillemann in Mexico, for example, synthesizes these approaches, pointing out that, I am quoting, neighborhoods, squares, shops, groups, individuals, and the like are not just passive elements waiting to receive policy directives, but are subsystems with their own strategies and purposes. The vitality or resilience of a city cannot be found on the level of the system city as a whole alone. What I especially invite you to read as part of your required minimum reading alongside this video is an extract from a text by Henri Lefebvre and co-authored by two French architects from 1986. You might have already heard of Henri Lefebvre as a major neo-Marxist theoretician of the contemporary urban condition. I will come back to that point later. But in his late writings, such as this text, Lefebvre turned to a more ecologically literate attention to the living complexity of the urban. In that text, you will read that, I quote, to authoritatively separate, disjoint and disarticulate its parts kills the city as it would any other complex living organism. Coming back to Dillman, in his article, he is also introducing a few examples of, I'm quoting again, 
eco-cultural innovations that are not contributing to the resilience of a city in a narrow sense of climate change mitigation or adaptation, but plant the seeds for local self-reliance and are a good model for investing in organizational and community learning. When he's pointing at organizational and community learning, notions which you can learn about if you read his article, what Dillemann also implies is that sustainable cities have to be creative sustainable cities. If you want to get a further look into this notion, I'm also including in your optional further reading an article from 2011 putting together the notions of urban complexity, of self-organization and organizational learning by local communities and of creative, sustainable cities, another keyword comes up, serendipity. The perspective which I am outlining here is in a complex, complementary tension with the notion of problem-based learning. It bases itself on question-based learning as advocated by the ecological artist David Haley. We are coming now to the last part, the right to the city and the tactics of everyday life. Henri Lefebvre was the father of the notion of right to the city, which in the meanwhile has become a slogan for a number of urban activists and artists who are denouncing the social unsustainability of contemporary urban development. Among the social ills that they are denouncing are the global competition of cities, which some economists, like Richard Florida, are celebrating as a rise of a creative class, with only little consideration for growing social and economic inequalities. You can read a bit more about this in the article by Julia Han and myself, which I already mentioned. One of these socially unsustainable urban processes is called gentrification. In short, and in the words of Neil Smith, gentrification is, opening quote, the process by which poor and working class neighborhoods in the inner city are refurbished via an influx of private capital and middle class home buyers and renters, neighborhoods that had previously experienced disinvestment and a middle-class exodus. If you read Neil Smith's text, then please consider these questions. In response to these issues, the right to the city movement has been growing around the world, and especially since 2009 in the German city of Hamburg. In short, the basic idea that this movement takes from Henri Lefebvre is that urban development should be self-determined by all participants in the life of a city, and not only by those who own real estate property and invest and speculate in the real estate markets. Furthermore, all segments of the population should have the possibility to experiment with and to realize alternative ways of life. This civil society movement, for example in Hamburg, in a block of houses called the Gängeviertel, aims to build a counterpower, facing the real estate lobbies and their political allies. The last bit of minimum reading I'm giving you is a very short two pages brief by Stan Goff. Stan Goff is a former US soldier and an anti war activist. It's a text about the tactics of everyday life. This is a notion that comes from Michel de Certeau and suggests that tactics is not necessarily subordinate to strategy, but can be opposed to it. Strategy here presumes control and power over the other out there. Tactics, as understood by de Certeau, is an adaptive, resilient and resistant response by the non-powerful without a preconceived plan of how things will turn out, but with readiness to take advantage of unpredictable changes. This slide is, as you can see, an overview of the minimum required reading related to this instructional video. As you know, there's also some further reading which you can read either now or in the coming weeks, depending on your research interests. And a last slide with image credits. See you very soon.